Um, how many of you here have seen something called the cross product in your math classes? Some of you, okay. Oh, most of you. So maybe, maybe this is not all that new. So um, the way your math classes introduce cross product is a slightly different from the way we introduce a cross product. So well, let me write it down and see if this is what you remember. So in your math classes, this is what you might have seen. If you have, let's say, two vectors, um, A and B, then these two vectors would have uh, three vector components, AX, X hat plus AY, Y hat plus AZ, Z hat, and B would be BX, X hat plus BY, Y hat plus BZ, Z hat. And um, in, math, in your math class, if they're trying to define what is cross product A cross B, then now they would uh, give you all the components for the x, all the component for y, and all the component for z. Is that how it was introduced in your math class? Yeah. Yes, OK, good. OK, now those of you who have seen this in your math class, tell me what those components are. <laughs> I have a, a trick for memorizing it, so I'll write it down. Um, so the x component, it should be ay bz minus az by. y component should be uh, az bx minus ax bz. z component should be ax by minus um, b, oh, sorry, I want to do it in the same order, a, y, b, x. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Um, so the trick that I used to memorize this is something called the cyclic permutation. Your math instructor may have mentioned it or not. Doesn't matter. This is not how we are, not, we are going to do it. I mean, there's a reason uh, math classes do it this way. This is more convenient for what they do. But what's more convenient for us is the definition of cross product uh, without use of the components. We want to define, um, so we want to, this is what I want to imagine. If I have two vectors, A and B, if I have vector A going this way and I have vector B going this way, let's say some, somewhere out in space, I want to be able to describe their cross product without having to define a coordinate axis. I mean, in your math classes, you always have coordinate axis because that's your starting point. But you know, in physics, we are trying to describe a physical system. Like when I walk around, I don't have axis in front of me unless I'm playing Minecraft and I'm using debug window. But so, um, so what, what we want to, we want to describe the cross product in a way that it's entirely independent from coordinate axis. Yeah. So, so let me do that. So let me. Um, so this is just uh, something for reference, and uh, this is the part I'm essentially cutting out. Um, in normal semesters, I would have gone through some explanation of this. I've shown you the whole determinant method of doing this. Not going to do any of that. I will just to describe definition of cross product the way we do it in physics of cross product, and here's really the. Well, yeah, and the thing that I'm not going to go into is how you can get from the physics definition to the math description of cross product. And that's really the reason why I prefer our version, because it's easier to go that way than the other way around. But uh, I have to cut that out <laughs> so that I can cover everything today. So um, let me start out with the initial setup. So I'm not even going to have all these component description of vector. Because my whole goal right now is to not define any coordinate axis. If I have to define my coordinate axis at any point, I have failed. So uh, let me uh, just to describe a vector, two vectors here. I have vector A going in some direction, and I have vector B going in some other direction. And um, I do need to describe something. I do need to describe the angle between them, their relative direction to each other. And I can do that without having to define coordinate axis. I can just uh, describe the angle between them. Yeah. 
So this, that's what I want you to imagine. I have, let me make my white half ruler vector A. This is vector B. They're just existing out in space with some angle between them. Um, if I you know, rotate or do anything to this, if I change the relative angle between them, then I'll be changing something. So, but I have this, and um, so I want to be able to describe a third vector that's a result of multiplying these two vectors. So at the very like first week of semester, I told you guys that um, when we are doing vector algebra, that multiplying vectors is complicated. You have so far seen dot product. You have seen the dot product where what you do with the dot product is if you have A dot B, what was the result of this uh, product? Did you get a vector back or did you get something that's not a vector? You got a scalar back, right? So this is a, was a scalar. So that product is a way of multiplying two vectors and get a, uh, something that doesn't have a direction back. The cross product, sometimes we call this the vector product for this reason. Sometimes people call this a vector product because this is a way of multiplying two vectors that's going to give me, uh, that's going to give me another vector back. It'll give me another quantity that has magnitude and direction. So I'll get, um, so this vector product, A cross B, this will give me another vector back. So what I want to walk you through is, um, and in physics way, like this is very unintuitive. Like why would anyone define anything this way? The reason I like physics definition is the physics definition is intuitive or at least there is a way to make it intuitive. So let me try to walk through this. Um, this will be a lot easier if you felt like you had a really good geometry class. If not, just suffer through the next couple minutes and you'll do fine. <laughs> um, so I have two geometric objects, a vector, and a geometric object that's similar to vector is a line, right? Because vector is uh, something with, yeah. yeah. Uh, so a vector, by its nature, it defines a line, a line that's a sort of going the same direction as this. So in this system where I have vectors A and B, I have two vectors, A and B. So in your, think about your geometry class, imagine you have two lines, two non-collinear lines. Uh, one line that's going one way and one line that's going another way, they make some angle between them. What, does, what geometric object does that define? Yeah, it's walking you back quite a bit. So let me just, uh, what do you need to define a line in geometry? You need two points, right? If you have a point and another point, then that can be used to define a line. All right, what's the next dimensional object? Plane, okay. What did you need to define a plane? Do you remember? You could do that with the three points. That would be like having one, two points that'll define a line. And if you have a third point, let's say third point on this board, that defines the plane of the board. But if you have a third plane, that third point that's way out here, then that defines a plane that looks like this, right? So that's maybe the base, most basic way to define a plane, but there are other equivalent combinations of geometrical object that will also define a plane. It's two lines, one of those. Two, two lines that intersect, right? So I have, so this defines a plane. Uh, when I put two vectors this way, there's a plane that contains both the vectors. And that's a, very, it, that's a unique plane. Um, if uh, there's no other plane that will contain both the vectors uh, within that plane. Yeah? So that's our starting point, that when you have two vectors at some angle, that defines a plane. And what we want to do is we want to describe the direction of that plane. How would you describe direction of that plane? So, you know, vectors describe direction. So I want to do it with a third vector. Now, can, you dis can I describe the direction of the plane with a third vector that's within the plane? No, there's an infinite number of vectors that's in this plane. 
two of which are these two vectors that was initially used to define the plane. So, um, so if I'm trying to use a third vector that's with, uh, tangent to the plane or within the plane, no, that's just not going to work. There's an infinite number of those vectors. I want to, so this is my goal. Uh, in trying to define the direction of the plane, I want to find a unique vector that I can associate with this plane so that I can say, all right, to a direction of that vector, that's the direction of my plane. How would I um, associate a vector with a plane in a way there's all unique, only one vector? So tangent vector would be the one that I just described, the vector that's within the plane. So if it's, it's I think you meant, you meant either perpendicular or normal. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, so perpendicular to the plane, right? Then you can already see, oh, that limits my choice down a lot. So, oh, my arm's hurting. Um, so, when you have this, uh, so when you have this plane of the board, if you're thinking of vectors that's perpendicular to the board, how many such vectors do I have? Everyone has two? Okay, Stephen, can you describe the two vectors? Yeah. So you could have vector that's pointing into the plane or a vector that's pointing out of the plane. So uh, I already used this notation before, right? Um, this circle with the x in it for vector into the plane, yes? And circle with a dot in it for a vector out of plane. So we want to associate um, direction of plane with one of these two vectors. So we want to say that A cross B, you know, which defines, so A and B, which defines the plane, and I want to say that the direction of this is one or the other. And this is the point where I have to tell you that we are just going to make an arbitrary choice. So we did our best to pick a unique vector and this is as far as we can get. We can narrow it down to choice between the two. And there's nothing mathematical or in laws of nature that will let us pick between the two. So we are just going to make an arbitrary choice. What's important about this arbitrary choice is that um, everyone on the earth make the same arbitrary choice. So you know, we look for some commonalities between people. You know, we all walk upright, we you know, walk onto a feet, we have some kind of bilateral symmetry. Um, now, could I have everyone raise their dominant hand? Yeah, so this is where you see why we choose the rule that I'm going to describe now. About 90% of us are not right-handed. So I don't mean to pick on the people who are left-handed, but because we are going to pick, it, this is an arbitrary choice. It could have easily been left-hand rule if, uh, I guess, whoever came up with the rule happened to be left-handed. But the chances were they were <laughs> right-handed because 90% of the people are right-handed. So we are going to use the dominant hand for most people as the, as the arbitrary choice that um, makes a choice between these two. So if you are left-handed, I'll just have to ask you to use your non-dominant hand to apply this rule. So this is the right-hand rule. We use uh, right-hand rule to pick between these two. And it could have easily been left-hand rule. And you know, if we meet up with some aliens in the future, they might easily have a left-hand rule instead of right-hand rule. So um, this is how I do right-hand rule. There are different versions out there. In your textbook, you might find the version involving three fingers. If you want to use it, fine, go ahead. I'm never going to use it. I prefer the version with the whole hand. This is especially important in physics 4B where this whole hand version morphs into other shortcut versions. So I use the one with the whole hand, and this is how you um, apply this right hand rule to make a choice between these two possible choices. So I take my hand, orient my hand, so that my hand is in the direction of the first vector. So it, the order matters here. So I put my hand in the direction of the first vector, then while it's still pointing in that direction, I can rotate it around in different orientations. And I pick the orientation of my hand that will allow me to bend my fingers in the direction of the second vector. So there should be only one such direction. So it's a choice between essentially this or uh, So this is not. So, so when, you are, when your hand is in that orientation, the direction of your thumb 
is the one that picks between these two. So the right hand rule says A cross B, while well, my thumb points out of the board. So we are going to say that A cross B points in this direction by right hand rule. Once again, this is an arbitrary choice. It can be, um, uh, it's an arbitrary choice. It, it, it can, um, it, we could have easily gone with the left hand rule. But the only thing is, you know, most of us are right handed, so it's easier for us to do it with our right hand. So we are just going to oppress the left handed people and have you do it with your non dominant hand. Um, but, you know, so, so, but that's the convention that everyone uses, so I highly recommend that you use that also. Um, so that's the first part of the definition of cross product A cross B. This tells you the direction. The direction of A cross B is direction that's perpendicular to the plane that contains A and B. And given the two choices, we pick the one unique choice by using right hand rule. All right? Uh, what else do I need to define a vector? The magnitude. So magnitude, I can't really think of an intuitive way to introduce it, so I'll just write it down for you. So the magnitude is defined this way. So the right hand rule, this is the first part of the definition of A cross B. And the second part, which gives you the magnitude, magnitude is, well, A cross B, and you take the magnitude. That's going to be equal to magnitude of A times magnitude of B, so A times magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between them, sine theta. Does this sound familiar? Magnitude of one vector times magnitude of another vector times the sine of the angle between them. Where have you seen it before? Hmm? Well, OK. Where have you seen it before in this class? With the torque, right? So it, what it is, the torque is actually defined uh, using cross product. So now I can actually tell you the actual definition of torque. So this torque here, this is how we define torque. We define torque as, um, this time I have to do it in correct order. I'm used to writing down force first and then the displacement. Turns out that's the wrong order. You have to do it R cross F. And this R is the displacement vector. So, so that's the torque. Um, let's see. And you need one more thing, the angular momentum here. So I was describing this using other rotational quantities, right? But as you might recall from before, every one of these rotational quantities, you can express it in terms of the translational quantities. You have seen that before. This is the fourth time <laughs> you are seeing me writing this down. Um, and you know, we just did that for torque. We described the torque in terms of force. So which translational quantity should, uh, can I describe angular momentum in terms of? Yeah, momentum. And sort of looking at this as the guide, I'm going to get relationship for between these two. I'm going to copy that over from here. So angular momentum will be same R, R cross not force, but momentum. Good. So this is how we actually associate vector direction with our rotational quantities. We do it through this uh, cross product, which is defined this way. And uh, you know, part of this description that I'm skipping is how these physics definitions employing rules one and two um, actually lead to the exact same thing as the math definition. If you want to work this out, this is, um, you know, you can do this on your own time. Let me encourage you to work out what is x cross y, or x head cross y. What is, um, I don't know, there's a nine, or uh, nine minus three. There's a six of these combinations. Let me just write them all down. x cross y, uh, x cross z, and, um, y cross x and y cross z and uh, two more, <laughs> um, g cross x and uh, g cross y. Uh, let me 
you know, encourage you to work this out on your own. It's a good right hand rule exercise. Um, everyone here knows how the three dimensional coordinate axis are defined. You may have, may not have seen it. So three dimensional coordinate axis, this, they are defined this way. If you have, this is x axis, this is y. So you know the z axis is perpendicular to both of them, right? Um, is it going into the board or out of the board? Yeah, so the axis itself is defined using the right hand rule. So the, the right handed axis is where x cross y is, you know, g is in that direction. So, you know, with this in mind, uh, try working this all out. Once you have that, this is what that'll, um, this will allow you to do. Once you have this, then uh, you can actually do this product. You know, plug in A, this, B, this. You have to do the whole distributing the product thing. And then when you work it out, um, using your knowledge of this, you'll get all of this. Mm. So, you know, that's the part that I kind of have to skip today because uh, not enough time. <laughs> um, but let me actually um, um, uh, touch on one thing. Um, I said that there are six combinations. Are there really six combinations combining, you know, uh, three, uh, you know, when you have some, uh, when you have some vector cross another vector and the order matters and there's three choices for this, three choices for this, are there really six choices or is there more than six? Anybody here know the combinatorics? Like if you have three possible choices here, three other possible independent choices here, What's the total number of independent choices? Nine, right? Three times three, nine. So I wrote down six, which means there must be three combinations that I didn't write down. Somebody tell me what those three are. Asia? Yeah, x cross x, y cross y. I skipped to all the ones where the vector was being crossed with itself. Oh. That's an other thing to do. Why do you think I skipped to this? In fact, if you try to apply right hand rule to this, you'll run into a trouble. Watch this. So let me see. Let me try to do x cross x. I take my right hand, orient it in the direction of x, and I try to orient my hand so that I can bend my finger in the direction of x. But well, that doesn't work. Uh, they are the same vector. Right? So it's, uh, the direction, the way we defined it, is undefined. There is no way to figure out what the direction of x cross x is. But it turns out I get saved by some other feature of our definition. Can someone tell me what you see in the second part of the definition that makes this entire point moot? That I don't have to worry about the fact that I don't know what direction x cross x is in. It, it's a zero degree between them, so what do you see? Yeah, so the magnitude will be zero. So I don't know what direction this vector is in, but it doesn't matter. It's a zero vector anyway. So, uh, so the, you know, those are the ones I skipped. X cross X gives you zero, Y cross Y gives you zero, Z cross Z gives you zero. 